This is VLX number 139. We are in Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 to 36. Today is called Whitewashed Tombs. The Lord give you his peace, and nomine pace sefiti, spiritu santi, amen. God our Lord, we ask the grace that all of our intentions, actions, and operations be directed purely to the service and praise of your divine majesty. In nomine pace sefiti, spiritu santi, amen. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his, his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides! straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So today, as you can tell, Jesus excoriates the hierarchy of his day. And the parallels to what we have in the church right now are mind-blowing. So if you have little kids that don't want to hear what's going on in the church, I'm not going to talk about anything on 6th or ninth commandment things, but if you uh, have kids that you don't want to, uh, them to know that our hierarchy is very similar, valid but corrupt, as Jesus uh, had to bring in, we are going to make some allusions. We're mostly going to look at Father Lapide and the Fathers. I even have a, a saint that I want to talk about today. So it's not all going to be parallels, but... We can't ignore this. We are going to have happier days in the VLXs where we don't have to bring it up to current events where we can look at what Father Lapide calls the tropological, which is the virtue-based stuff. Uh, but today it is clearly an excoriation of the hierarchy, so we do have to talk about that. Let's look at the Greek of the very first verse. Again, we are in Matthew 23, verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. So, uai, that means woe, de humin, to you. And then we have grammates. You can probably hear the root or cognate there. Gramma is where we get grammar. 
and that means the scribes, those who write. And then the Greek sounds just like the English, pharisaioi, that's Pharisees, and hypokritoi. Anytime you hear hoi, that's the plural in Greek, we have some words even in English that come from that, like hoi poloi, that's both Greek and English, especially English for the rabble, most people on the planet, the hoi poloi. And so hypokritoi, you can probably figure out, means plural for hypocrites. And then hoti is because, now listen to the, the next verb here, it's kleate. Kleate uh, probably is the root of our clothes since it starts with kl or cl in our case. For you close the, and then it's interesting, the very next word is basileon, which means empire or kingdom. You close the empire, you close the kingdom of what? Ton uranon, uranon. That's of the heavens. But it's interesting, when before you get to the word heavens, because we're kind of used to hearing kingdom of heaven, just to see in the Greek there, you close the empire. The Pharisees, the hypocrites, they're closing the empire of God. And how are they doing this? Well, they're doing it by being hypocrites. And we're going to see what the church fathers, I have to say about that in a minute. And so Jesus says, neither will you enter. And then as the Dewey Reem says, and those that are going in, you suffer not to enter. Now, why does it use the word suffer in the Dewey Reems? Well, let me give you the Greek word by word here. Ude means neither. Tus is the uh, plural. And then eser homenos is a participle, meaning those entering, those who would be entering. Afiete means to allow, and eselthen is the infinitive to enter. So neither are you allowing those who would enter to enter into this empire of heaven. So there's people following Jesus who would want to become full followers of Christ, and the Pharisees are actually keeping people from him. This is extremely serious because Jesus is saying, neither are you going to enter the kingdom, nor are those who would be entering the kingdom. Extremely serious what's going to be on their heads, the particular judgment and general judgment for keeping God's little ones from God himself. I have a recent blog called Fear-Mongering and Negligence on Teaching Hell, and I allude to the fact that many American bishops say something along these lines. Well, we know hell exists, but we don't know if anybody's there. And in this blog, I show it's infallibly stated in the Council of Trent, we know for sure there's people in hell. So one example of this today is bishops and priests who say, well, we know hell exists, but we don't know anybody goes there. That is extreme negligence that is going to be greatly punished by God because we have not only numerous lines from our Lord, numerous lines from the saints, but the infallible Council of Trent saying not everybody is saved. In fact, it's so interesting to me how many people just make Jesus this hippie. Of course, he was love incarnate. Of course, he was um, infinite love in the flesh on earth. And because he was infinite, it's not even but or despite, it's because he's infinite flesh. He wants to make sure we don't destroy ourselves by following Satan, who's always so sneaky. Satan doesn't come at us with, you know, a, uh, a forked tail and uh, little hooves. He always comes at us with what is going to be attractive or maybe a, a very gentle lie. And so Jesus has to use very harsh words to wake people up. In fact, Father Lapide is going to show us that just as there were eight Beatitudes, so also today we will hear eight warnings against the scribes. 8 and 8. Wow, you almost might think this are of equal importance. Well, if we make it to heaven, please God, it won't be of equal importance. Only the Beatitudes will be fulfilled in the beatific vision. But here on earth, in some sense, we have to weigh these equally because of the great danger that exists to our salvation. So Father Lapide says this, Observe that as Christ enumerated eight Beatitudes, repeating the word blessed eight times in St. Matthew chapter 5, so also here does he bestow eight maledictions upon the impious scribes, eight several times, repeating the word woe. Christ, the new lawgiver, imitates Moses, the ancient lawgiver, who promises many blessings to those who keep the law and threatens with as many curses those who break it, end quote. So there's a lot of people, a lot of Catholics today, love to do the typology on Jesus and Moses, they want to talk about the blessings, but nobody wants to talk about the curses. But as we walk through this valley of tears in this time of danger to our salvation, of course we have a moral hope and we know God wants us in heaven even more 
even more than we want to be in heaven. But we have to recognize the danger to our salvation. And this is where we have to pay attention to these maledictions, that Jesus isn't just the new lawgiver as Moses, as the new Moses. He's also the one that enumerates what's going to happen if we are hypocrites and, and Pharisees and scribes. And so today, the thing I really want you to listen for is legalism. The, what Jesus is really excoriating the hierarchy's day for doing is basically sidelining, sidelining common sense for a bunch of loopholes of first century canon law. And this is one reason I'm constantly hammering away to use your common sense. It's not because I don't believe in divine revelation that there's times the saints did things that were not irrational, sometimes super rational, like St. Francis standing on his head. But those are rare times. In, in a time of so many lies that come at us, we really have to put simple supernatural faith and simple supernatural hope and simple supernatural charity ahead of all these legalistic loopholes of canon law that many people are getting to be masters at. So today I really want you to listen how our Lord holds it against the Pharisees and scribes for playing all these little games with God instead of what he calls the weightier issues of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. And there is a saint, you know, I think probably every saint lives out the Beatitudes. Let's talk about the Beatitudes here one more time. The two greatest saints, of course, who lived out the Beatitudes was the Blessed Mother of God, the Holy Theotokos, and then St. Joseph. All the saints lived out the Beatitudes, but I believe there is one who has an extraordinary connection to the Beatitudes, and this connects to what I was saying about two minutes ago, how Jesus is the new lawgiver, Jesus is the new Moses. Well, where did Moses give the law? He gave it on Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the place of the Ten Commandments. Do you know there's a New Testament, a New Covenant saint who's buried on Mount Sinai? Probably a couple. But the most famous one is one of my very favorite saints, and her name is St. Catherine of Alexandria. She was a martyr, I think it was the 4th century in Alexandria, Egypt, and extremely smart, extremely beautiful. And she was a martyr, and the angels took her body from Alexandria, Egypt to Sinai. And that's where she is still buried today. And so I believe if you study her life, and I have a bit, if you study the life of St. Catherine of Alexandria, I believe she is the new, almost incarnation of the Beatitudes. Why do I believe this? One, because of her life. And two, the fact that she is buried on Mount Sinai, the place of the old law, I think that could be, and I don't, I don't say this on the authority of any church fathers or saints. This is just my own personal opinion. This could be God telling us, this is the new law lived out in the wisdom and the martyrdom of a saint as great as St. Catherine of Alexandria. Again, buried on Sinai, the very place the Ten Commandments were given. So I sort of see in her, she is the Beatitudes. Here is the crowning aspect of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, namely the Beatitudes lived in St. Catherine of Alexandria. And according to those lines, even though Mary is the only true exemplar of the Catholic Church, in some sense, we could say maybe a, a very, very, very distant second would be St. Catherine of Alexandria as the new law is on Mount Sinai in her, in some sense. Again, this is just my opinion, but I'm a, she's one of my favorite saints, and I think it's not a coincidence that God had his angels bring her body to Mount Sinai where she's buried today. So back to the text today, you know, just as Jesus he did appear to St. Catherine of Alexandria, who was a pagan. He wanted her as a pagan to get to heaven. She had some mystical experiences. She was baptized, died a martyr, and a virgin. And just as he wants to get every pagan and every Jew and every Muslim and every Catholic to heaven, so also all the Jews that surrounded him in the first century, he wanted to get them to heaven. And the number one obstacle, all these people who had seen his miracles and his teaching and his face, all of these things, it was the Pharisees claiming that he was bad and they were the true authority, essentially, that uh, he saved the most harsh words for them. So heaven, that is this kingdom of heaven, this empire of heaven that Jesus wants to bring everybody to. And about that kingdom, Father Lapia says, it is as if Jesus were to say, for this kingdom has been shut for 4,000 years through Adam's sin. I, expiating that sin by my death, will now open it, that whoso believeth in me and followeth my life may enter into the open kingdom. Wherefore, many of the Jews, being aroused by my preaching, are striving to enter in. But you, O ye scribes, turn them away and shut heaven against them 
by your vain and perverse traditions which ye instill into their minds. And then Father Lapide continues quoting St. John Chrysostom, who says, The kingdom of heaven is holy scripture. The door is the understanding of scripture, or Christ. The bearers of the keys are the scribes and priests. The key is the word of knowledge. The opening of the door is interpretation. Ye also cause men to offend by your wickedness and evil example, and because ye calumniate and persecute me, and draw them away from believing in me, which is the road to heaven, for I am the door, because by me alone there is entrance into heaven." End quote. So notice right there today that we're not actually saying like Protestants do that these Pharisees and scribes don't matter. St. John Chrysostom just pointed out the fact they do. He actually said, the bearers of the keys are the scribes and priests. So just like me today, when I speak about church reform, I admit the current hierarchy is valid, but many of them are corrupt. And it's because I believe that they're valid that I speak so much about this. Because just as St. John Chrysostom said, these are the bearers of the keys of the kingdom. And so when they act like hypocrites and keep people from them by playing, can keep people from coming to Christ through canon law games instead of just the simplicity of Catholicism, they're going to burn in hell forever for doing this. Because Jesus is saying that very same thing to the hierarchy of his day. And this is why it's so serious that we sideline all of these legal loopholes and start to put the Bible and the magisterium ahead of all of these games. And so this is why St. James says, not many of you should be teachers. Not many of you should be teachers. On today's commentary, Father Lapide says, wherefore such a teacher deserves and brings upon himself as many hells as the number of souls whom he corrupts and destroys, because he is not a teacher and promoter of salvation, but a betrayer. And so he again speaks as what Christ would say, wherefore ye shall receive greater damnation. Father Lapide continues, the Syriac translates, ye are about to receive the extremist judgment, both because ye rob from widows and because, as St. John Chrysostom says, ye paint avarice the color of religion, that iniquity may be loved, being esteemed as piety. Boy, does that remind you of anything going on in the Catholic Church right now, those who call good evil and evil good? Father Lapide, in reflection of our Lord Jesus, says those people will, rest- will receive the most extreme judgment. Not prostitutes, not people that are doing things that they feel shameful for. It's going to be the hierarchy who call evil good and good evil who are going to receive the most extreme judgment there, in the words of Father Lapide. Now, who were these proselytes at the time? You might think, since Judaism was the one true religion, maybe the one good thing the Pharisees and scribes were doing were making converts. Ah, but Father Lapide has insight, because he read more of the fathers than you or me, and so he shows us why these Pharisees were trying to make converts. He says, The scribes strove to turn many Gentiles to Judaism, for the sake of ambition as well as avarice, that they might augment their oblations, sea and land that is the whole world. So what he's saying right there is the Pharisees and scribes who were converting Gentiles to become Jewish, it wasn't because they were interested in their eternal salvation. They were only interested in their money. And now let's look at verse 16 forward. We have a lot on all of this swearing. And I think if I just had to conglomerate into one sentence, it would be stop playing games with God. That's really what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here, is they had all these special games to basically cover their tails, both with the people and somehow with their consciences. And Jesus is saying, you can't play games with God. Father Lapide says, observe from the words in Matthew 5.34 that the scribes thought from what God had commanded that they should swear by him alone, an oath by any creature was not an oath nor obligatory, But being blinded by avarice, they accepted such things, E-X-C-E-P-T-E-D, such things as being offered to God, filled their own coffers, as if these alone were to be accounted most sacred. Wherefore, they are rightly called by Christ blind guides. So again, we here we have this legalism on swearing or promises and sitting, instead of just letting your yes be yes. Now, we know that there was a debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees on the resurrection of the body, but what excuse do modern bishops have to be corrupt and take people's money and everything if they actually believe in heaven and hell? Here's the secret answer to that. They don't believe in hell. They don't really believe they have a danger of going to hell. 
And so when you teach or believe everyone's saved, you actually have no interior system of accountability because it's always about how to save face with yourself as a bishop or the diocese. Do you see how dangerous it is to believe, dare we hope that all men be saved? Because what it ends up doing is it allows you to make excuses for your own corruption for the sake of a good exterior. And this is what we're going to hear in the second half of today's entire section is the hierarchy of Jesus' day only cared about a pious front, not about their own interior conscience. And then Father Lapide also adds, Moreover, the scribes were wont to say that the oblations were more holy than the temple itself, that they might make men more ready for offerings than for prayers. So what we have right there is the priests of the day were more worried about money than the temple. Okay, sorry to do it again. What's the connection today? You know, I've been in many different parishes, and I'm always shocked how even mildly pious pastors will frequently keep the keys in the tabernacle for anybody to come in. Do you think any of those pastors of those Catholic churches in, in the United States would ever allow in the sacristy the safe where all the money's kept just to be wide open or allow the turn dial code just to be on a piece of paper right out in the open in the sacristy for everybody to see? Of course not. There is no priest in the United States who would allow the safe with all the money in the sacristy to be open for everybody to see or have access to. Why then is the key kept in the tabernacle where we have the most precious thing on the planet, the Son of God and the Eucharist? Why is that kept there in so many parishes? Well, you can learn what people value by what they do. And so Jesus isn't saying, for example, by analogy, that priests shouldn't keep the people's money in the sacristy today in modern Catholic churches in a safe. The problem is they're not taking care of the weightier things. And this is why when Jesus is talking about tithing on mint, he actually says right after that, these you should have done and the weightier aspects of the law. So this is what Father Lapide says there. He says, this is as if our Lord were to say, therefore you are unbelievers in that you lack faith, hope, and charity, which are the things that God above all requires. According to the words in Micah 6, 8, I will show thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. These are the things which ye ought to have done and not to omit the others, such as the tithing of mint, which was either commanded or permitted by the law. So what our Lord is saying here is you have the priority of everything all jumbled up. And I think that's the same for us. Today. We as Catholics have to get back to the very basics of faith and hope and charity, not all of these ways that I can find a loophole to sin. And then let's look at verse 24. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Father Lapide says, all the codices, Greek, Latin, Syriac, and Arabic have camel, which is properly opposed to gnat as something very large to something very small. The sentence is proverbial, it means, Ye have exact care of trifling things, such as tithing of herbs, lest anyone should defraud you in the smallest possible degree, but you at the same time commit without any scruple all manner of injustice, rapine, and other wickedness, as big as it were, as camels, which ye may be said to swallow down." End quote. And so this is why I think it's hilarious when Norman Catholics call traditional Catholics Pharisees, because it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Who's the one trying to follow the basics of the gospel and the Ten Commandments? And then who's the group who's finding legalistic loopholes in canon law to keep sinning? This is what's so funny about that, is traditionalists are actually, if you really look at the commentary of the Fathers and Father Lapide, and even if you just straight up read Matthew 23, traditionalists are the least pharisaical of all Catholics today, because they're following the basic gospel instead of playing all of these games with God. And then verse 25 reads, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. And Father Lapide says, The meaning is, You, O ye Pharisees, studiously wash and cleanse your hands, your bodies, the cups and plates and glasses out of which you eat and drink, but you fill your conscience with the uncleanness of rapine and every sort of wickedness. Now what does that remind you of? Priests really worried about washing their hands 
and not their consciences or others. Of course, this is so easy. This reminds me of two years ago when so many priests replaced the holy water with hand sanitizer. I mean, could there be another more clear allusion to the Pharisees worried about washing their hands instead of the inner clean, cleanness? Now, does holy water clean? No, but St. Teresa of Avila says holy water does keep demons away. Even more pronounced than this was the few dioceses, thankfully there were only few, that actually closed down baptism, and actually many dioceses closed down confession. Now, speaking of confession, let's look at verse 26 right here. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. So here we have this call to repentance. And we in the New Covenant, of course, have baptism and confession for the forgiveness of sins, which cleanses us interiorly. And our Lord's saying that's so much more important than an exterior cleansing. And so that leads to where we get the name of today's VLX, verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Shows us how much more important to be right with God on the inside than just looking pious on the outside. And then verse 29, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. You know, this is why it's funny to me how many Catholics rip on the prophets God has sent us. Look at someone like Father Jim Altman. Now, people often hold some of his stylistic points against him. I was talking to a friend of mine. Uh, we were overlooking New York City, and he runs a podcast. Kind of made a little comment about he likes Father Altman a little bit about the stylistic points. I said, look, you have a son. What if a priest did you know what to that son of yours? and you have your current podcast, how would you speak about that priest? And he immediately got it. He immediately understood why I was defending even the stylistic points of Father Altman because he's one of the few priests, Father Altman's one of the few priests that really sees himself as married to the church. And when you see someone doing this to your spouse, you're probably going to use some language that colors outside of the boundaries just a little bit. I mean, this is why he always uses the term we heard in today's gospel, the, the brood of vipers. But anyway, the point today is that certain hierarchy points to saints of the past and said, oh, I would have always been with them if I had been there. Well, do you know the current modernist Vatican just put out a document promoting contextual theology, which basically means if you can come up with a socio-cultural excuse for any issue that you want to promote, doctrinal or moral aberrancy, you can do that. You can divert from traditional theology as long as you can show a socio-cultural excuse for it. And we know this is going to happen, especially on moral issues, Sixth Commandment ones. And those modernists, speaking of Sixth Commandment sins, they always quote St. Thomas Aquinas saying, oh, well, a erroneous conscience has to be followed. Now, did he say that? Yes, but he didn't mean it like the way they say it. And so they take it out of context. Kind of funny we're using the word context. They take that out of context, but really what they're doing is exactly what the hierarchy did, pretending like they line up with a saint or a prophet from the past just to promote their own money, their own power, and the destruction of souls. Do you see how we're living this out again so severely right now? And then the next line, you have to remember the ancient hierarchy back then versus today. This is one thing that's not going to be found in a parallel today. The Jewish hierarchy was very concerned with the bloodline pedigree. And so our Lord kind of makes a funny jab at them to say, yeah, you actually are in the bloodline pedigree of all these people you claim that you uh, follow and you have all this power because you're in the right bloodline of Abraham. He says, yeah, you do have the pedigree of killing the prophets. Verse 31, he says, Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. You've probably heard it mentioned on a census fidelium talk that a human who's saved can do reparation for his sins in purgatory, but a city or a state or a country that sins has to fill up the reparation here on earth because there is no such thing as purgatory. So Father Lapide says along those lines, so also God said to Abraham in Genesis 15, 16, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The imperfect author says, God does not immediately punish a nation or a city when they sin, but waits for many generations and sometimes threatens and sometimes chastises in part. But the longer he waits, the more just may be his judgment. 
But when God does determine to destroy that city or nation, he seems to avenge upon them the sins of all the preceding generations, as though that generation alone suffered what all the previous ones deserved. Thus God commanded Saul to blot out the posterity of Amalek on account of the wickedness of their parents and their perpetual hostility to Israel, 1 Samuel 15, 16. So I think what Father Lapide is getting at here is the destruction of Jerusalem was especially for the crucifixion of Christ, but they had also stored up all the blood of all the prophets before him that they had killed too. Verse 33 and 34, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. So our Lord is talking about certain martyrs in the Old Testament, and we know by oral tradition more than what's in the Bible how some of them died. We're going to hear this is also allusion to himself and the saints. And again, keep in mind for today, even today, most Catholics are rejecting the very few prophets that are being sent to them. Let's see what Father Lapide has to say. He says, verse 34 means, Because ye as serpents and vipers will kill me, your Messiah, for which wickedness you will be cut off and condemned to hell. I have had pity on you and will send you my disciples after my death, that they may avert from you this destruction, that they may arouse you to repentance and faith in me. But then what do the religious leaders do with the apostles? Father Lapide continues, Some of them you will kill, as St. Stephen by stoning, James the Greater by sword and crucify, crucify and St. Simeon, Bishop of Jerusalem, successor of St. James. And some of them you will scourge, as Peter and the apostles in Acts 4 and 5, and persecute them from city to city, like Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 and 14. And then the last two verses today, 35 and 36 of Matthew chapter 23. So that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So what our Lord is saying is, you will pay, and that's going to be done by the destruction of Jerusalem, which, as you all know, happened about 40 years after they killed Jesus. A couple things from Father Lapide here. He quotes St. John Chrysostom saying, Even as the rewards which all the preceding generations deserved were bestowed upon those who received Christ, so what their wicked ancestors merited came upon the latest Jews. So notice, that's actually a very positive statement right there. What St. John Chrysostom is saying is, the Jews of Acts of the Apostles who were actually baptized and converted, it's no wonder they were given all these miracles and graces, knowing Our Lady personally, seeing all these miracles, probably performing numerous miracles themselves. So um, that first century was this explosion in blessings and destruction both because of what had been stored up among God's chosen people. And if you heard Dr. Taylor Marshall, I really encourage you to listen to one of his last ones on Can Christians Support Israel? Because it's not a political podcast. It's really about Romans 9 through 11, how there's only one tree. There's not two trees. There's only one tree, which is God's tree. And at the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that fulfillment in Christ, who is God himself, you have to remember, because he's God himself, there's only one tree, and that's entirely fulfilled in the New, New Testament. So the Old Testament flows directly into the New Testament. This is actually just, it's one God and it's one gathering. This is why it's so important we realize how many Jews were baptized in the first century. Then on the negative side, though, Father Lapide says this, the Jews, even though they knew the divine vengeance which pursued Cain's fratricide, not only imitated it, but far transcended it by slaying Christ, the Son of God, and his apostles, we may add that although Cain was not a direct forefather of the Jews, he was one of their collateral ancestors. He was the brother of Seth, from whom Abraham and the Jews were sprung. And finally, who was this Zacharias mentioned in Matthew 23 today? Father Lapide says the most probable option is that he was Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, who with base ingratitude towards him, not in his heart, towards him, was slain in an awfully sacrilegious manner by King Joash in the most holy place, that is to say, in the court of the priests, which was between the temple or the holy place, and the altar of burnt offering, for this altar was in the court of the priests, see 2 Chronicles 24. So St. Jerome and others say this, 
Zechariah is slain between the temple and the altar, marking the stones with indelible spots of blood. For although there were other prophets slain by the Jews after Zechariah, he is the last whose murder is related in Scripture. Add to this that Scripture makes mention only of the blood of Abel, and this Zacharias is crying out for vengeance. St. John Chrysostom says, Christ makes mention of Abel to show that they would kill Christ and his apostles out of envy, as from envy Cain slew Abel, and makes mention of Zacharias because the holy man was slain in the holy place. And so our Lord Jesus Christ here is referring to his own death, that he will be killed in the holy place of Jerusalem just a couple days out. Please say an Our Father for me at benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et filii, et spiritus sancti, descendet super vos, et maniat semper. Amen.